The SAS was born in the western deserts of World War II, but it really came of age in the jungles of Malaya in the 1950s. One of the most notable SAS jungle operations was Op Barris in Sierra Leone in September 2000, where they rescued hostages from the Royal Irish from the West Side Boys. Today we're going to have a look at the kit that may have been worn by a trooper from D Squadron 22 SAS, and alternatively, the gear worn by a soldier from One Para who assisted them on Op Barris. So while you're watching this, one, bear in mind it's raining, we're trying to get as good audio as we can, but it may get a bit patchy at points, and two, bear in mind this is an airsoft video, it's not for reenactment, it's not for living history, so we have made concessions that it's for airsoft skirmishing. Primarily that will mean that we don't really talk about PPE, so your gloves, your eye pro and your boots. You really should wear what's appropriate for you. just like to say a massive thank you to West Midlands Airsoft to FOB for letting us come down and use their site for filming this loadout video. So unfortunately when I turned on the weather effects for our Falklands video I forgot to turn them off again. So for our basic set of kit today I'm wearing a set of British Army Tropics. Now trousers and a shirt. You notice I'm not wearing a smock. You wouldn't wear a smock in the jungle. It would be way too hot. Also, these dry out really fast, being a blend of natural and synthetic fabrics. And they're in a lighter shade of DPM than the normal issue garments. So at this time, it would have been Combat 95. Now the Paras are not Barras when they went in. Some of those guys may well have been wearing Combat 95s. The guys that had been in longer probably had Tropics on. The only photo of the SAS in operation during Op Barras shows two guys in Tropics. So that's what I'm wearing today. Both of these are early 90s dated trousers and the shirt and they're made of a nice, breathable fabric. Maybe not so great for days like this, but I should dry off first as well. I've got two big pockets on the top. Unlike a smock, I don't have any pockets down here. These are really designed to be tucked in. I've got them loose, like the reference photo. My bulgy pockets, I've got compasses and notepads and a few other bits and bobs in there and a first field dressing. And in my trousers, I'd have a map. I also have a side pocket, and I'm just carrying my cam cream in there for now. Unit socks may have varied. I've also covered up the buttons with a bit of tape, so if I'm crawling around, I'm not going to rip the buttons off. Again, I'm wearing tropical issue trousers in a much lighter fabric. Again, these are more breathable and lightweight, and they'll dry out. These have two hand warmer pockets and two cargo pockets, one on each side. So for my footwear today, I've got a set of British Army issue jungle boots on. These are very much inspired by the US issue Vietnam jungle boot. In fact, these ones are Welgos, so they're US issue as well. With the Panama sole. Now, personally, they're not my favourite boot. I probably wouldn't wear them, but I'm wearing them today for authenticity's sake. And they've got speed laces, which makes them a bit easier to take on and off than the older pattern jungle boot. The British air softing, unless it's really dry, I probably wouldn't wear them because they're designed to let water in and out. Great for today's loadout. And these are only £10 from our local surplus store. So for our headwear today, we've got this boonie or jungle hat in DPM. The soldier that had it before me, this is Army Surplus, got it from Anchor Supplies. Let's put a couple of stitches in to pull the crown down to make it a more alley shape. And the brim is nice and short, it doesn't stick out miles anyway, so he still maintains good situational awareness. Now when you're in the jungle, you also sweat a lot, and you might need to get sweat off your hands or off your eyes. So British Army issues sweat rags. This one's been tailored into a tube and sewn together just to make it a bit more handy and just allows you to quickly mop your face. If you get really sweaty, you maybe clean off your hands if you need to do something quite dexterous. The other thing it's really good for, if you're patrolling along in the jungle, turning your head all the time, it stops you grinding your neck. And on even these soft shirts, that can get really irritating really fast. Again, these are just a few pounds. This was three quid and my partner Joe tailored it up for me and this hat, £4.99, absolute bargain. So for our really budget option, we're wearing a chest rig. More suitable for vehicle commanders, people in helicopters and infantry on foot in the jungle, because you can't really carry enough to survive out of. You could quite happily fight out of it for a short op. 
We've got magazine pouches on the front, utility pouches, in this case holding a couple of water bottles, and a map pouch or admin pouch in the middle. Lightweight, cheap, and fantastic. With this, this is our complete budget loadout. So this kit isn't very expensive at all anyway. My trousers are about 20, my shirt about the same. Chest rig, somewhere between 15 and 20 pounds. My hat was a fiver and my boots were 10. Around 60 pounds in total. Absolutely fantastic. Another option, particularly if you want to do a power loadout for Mock Barris, would be an Ops vest. This one is an early trials pattern, missing a couple of features that went into the issue vest. Carries absolutely tons for an airsoft game and usefully has an internal holster on the left hand side so you can cross draw a pistol out if you want to carry one. So I'm wearing a custom set of PLC webbing which has been directly sewn onto a hip pad and a roll pin belt added. This was probably either an early JJ's or a Dragon, don't really know. If you recognise it, let me know in the comments. And this is really to survive out of as well as fight. We've got enough carriage for food, rations, survival gear, as well as ammunition and ordnance like grenades. So I've taped up all of my excess straps so it doesn't go flapping around. And the guys quite liked rolling belt through in the jungle because they'd lose so much weight over the course of a couple of weeks, they could just talk it in and make it more secure. These sets I've seen go for silly money on eBay. I picked this one up for about 35 quid. Again, referencing our pretty much only photograph of the SAS at Op Barris. The guy in the lead is carrying a Colt M16A2. Quite a lot like this one. This is a very old classic army. Now, A2s are actually quite hard to get these days. Hopefully someone will pick it up and start making them. Now, another notable thing about Op Barris is it was the first time the Canadian C8s were trialled with 22 SAS, the gun that later turned into the L119A1. There are no photos of that, but we have heard that they were in operational trials at the time. So you could potentially go with one of the longer 16 inch barreled or 15.9 inch barreled L119A1s. That would be quite appropriate. Another alternative, if you wanted to do a power loadout rather than an SAS one, would be to go with an L85. Now this example is an L85A2. At the time it would have been an L85A1 with the round cocking lever. However, for airsoft terms, no one's really gonna mind if you turn up with one of these. So if you're doing an SAS loadout and you want to carry a sidearm, a SIG 226 or 229 would have been carried. Most of the paras being infantry wouldn't have been issued a sidearm. Some of the officers might well have had one. Other weapons that are in use, the trail guy in the photograph is carrying a para mini-me. These weren't on general issue to the British Army at this time, so this would have been a direct purchase from FN. That would be great for this. L96 sniper rifles may have been used by some of the recce teams. That's quite probable. Although there isn't an airsoft one, a GPMG would have been used by the assault teams. If you can get one, a Chinook with a minigun on it, it would be absolutely perfect. So whilst there were several elements from D Squadron involved in the hostage rescue section of Op Barris, some of the guys were doing recce in the jungle and their job was to observe the camps and then take down any guards just as the assault went in. The assaulters came in via Chinook and they wore armour. Now, we don't have all the super duper amazing cry stuff that we do now, so they were wearing ECBA and helmets. Now, it's not known whether they were using para helmets from one para or they'd taken Mark VI helmets out. So we've got both here today. Either would be absolutely fine. If you want to be a bit more rally, maybe go for a para helmet. So these are three to four times more expensive than a Mark VI. You'd probably get a power helmet for about 80 to 100 pounds, get a Mark VI for 15 to 20. ECBA, you can get a cover for about a fiver, and I've just got some British Army roll mat I've cut up to fit in this one. This is another thing where a roll pin belt comes in really useful, because it expands and contracts as you need it to go over armor. Now for most airsoft games, armor really has no purpose other than for aesthetics. In some film sim and mil sim games, you may well get an extra life wearing a ballistic helmet and armour. So if you're doing one of those games, it could be a great idea if you're doing an assault. If you really enjoy these loadout videos and you'd like to help us make them, you can join our Patreon scheme and also help keep the channel as independent as possible. 
you want to make a one-off contribution, why not buy one of our t-shirts from the Teespring store? Link is also down in the description. Most importantly, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Hush, hush, judge. Did we fade out to dog? Hostage. <laughs> fade out to dog. Quick, fade out to dog. Fade to dog. He's a good boy, isn't he? Look at that good boy. No dogs were harmed in the making of this video.